Well, good morning. That ever feel like your life? Uh, Denise's house looks exactly like that. That's exactly, she said last night, that was our week right there, right there. So you have a young kid. Yes, okay. So it's good to see you guys this morning. We're glad you're here. Now, here's the thing. We're, today we're going to talk about how love reigns over our present. And here's the deal. You know, last week we talked about kind of who we are in Christ, what he's done in our past, and how he replaces our sinfulness with his righteousness. And this week what we're going to talk about is this whole idea of living in the present. And so today I want to give you, I'm going to give you one thing that you can do that really will help you to accomplish God's will. Um, you know, two thoughts, two questions for you. Number one is, do you have joy? And I'm not talking about fake joy. I'm not talking about, hey, how are you? I'm not talking about church lady joy, okay? Isn't that special? By the way, you're old if you know that skit, because that's really old now. It's almost as old as you look marvelous. Almost that old. So, so, you know, not fake joy, but do you have joy? And then the second one is, are you really living in God's purpose? And today, this message, I've got some verses and, and maybe even one set that you can put on the refrigerator that might help you to remember. Years ago, I used to surf. I know that's hard to believe, and, and the reason I don't surf anymore is twofold. Number one, I'm too heavy for my board. It just happens. And number two is, uh, I'm lazy. And uh, we have our new surf ministry started, by the way, you guys back there. We appreciate you guys going out to Keith and Beth back there doing our surf ministry. If you're interested in that, and talk to them. But uh, so I'll never forget, though, one summer I was out surfing with some friends, and we had a perfect day. Now, I know that you don't know the difference, maybe, but if you're a surfer, there's days where you call it uh, uh, the wash basin or the, or the bathtub or the, the bathtub when it's flat or the washing machine when you're just getting beat up by the waves. But then there's other days when the wind is just right and the waves are just right, that the waves are clean and clear. And when you push your surfboard to go through even these giant waves, it's like cutting butter. It just goes right through, and man, there is not, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? There is not a day like that. There's no way to explain it to somebody other than, oh man, this is what it's supposed to be like. So we had a day just like that. And so we were out surfing, and we were going on the waves. We were having a blast. We were riding waves, and the waves weren't breaking on the beach. They were breaking out, so we were on the outside and, and coming in. It was great over and over and over riding. And all of a sudden, one of the guys I was with goes, where are we? To which I looked up at the beach. There were no more buildings, which tells you how long ago this was, right? There were no markers of where we were. And we realized we have been carried who knows how far down the beach. We estimate it from later that we were carried about a mile down the beach. So we had to go up on the beach figure out where we were, which way the waves were going, and then just start walking and walking and walking to get back where we were supposed to be. And let me tell you how good the waves were. We did it again. <laughs> and we didn't care. Now, here's what I'll tell you that happens to us. If you're not careful, if you don't pay attention in life, especially on these days, and we've all had days like this, whether it's at work whether it's with a relative, whether it's what the doctor tells you, <laughs> right? Whether it's that email you got, whether it's that phone call you got in the middle of the night, whether it's like when I was coming in today, there was an accident on 520. I have no idea how that even happened. Somebody got a phone call last night. When it's like that, it's very easy to realize, oh man, I don't know where I'm at. But the truth is, even on the best days, if you're not careful, you will drift. And before you know it, your days will just be going by and you haven't paid attention to today. And so what I'm going to tell you today, we're going to relate all of it to the mirror. You know, there's a Bible verse that talks about looking in God's word and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to you like a mirror. Here, I'll get you guys all the light that I get. Right. And, and so here's the thing. There are times in life that not, I'm not talking about being selfish and looking at yourself in the mirror. But I'm talking about allowing God's word to show you what's really going on with you. Where am I? 
And there's times that you need to take out the mirror of God's word, allow the Holy Spirit to convict you and show you what's going on in your life. And my hope is as you do that, you'll have joy. You know, First Corinthians or Romans 15, 13 says, you know, this whole idea is that you can be filled with joy. So today we're going to talk about surrendering like Jesus. And we all know what surrender looks like when it comes to uh, war. You know, when somebody surrenders, they do this. And by the way, if, if you've never done this, okay, you might see me raising my hands sometimes during church, and you might be one of these. It's like, I don't know why people raise their hands. Well, let me just make it simple for you. It's a, a way of surrender. So whether you do uh, uh, Presbyterian hand raising, Methodist hand raising, Baptist hand raising, or charismatic hand raising, the whole idea is of surrender. And so there's a time when we're singing songs of worship that, that in the middle of that, maybe God speaks to your heart and you have to say, I surrender. I surrender this problem. I surrender this trial. I surrender this good thing. I surrender my pride. But it's all about surrender. And John 3, 16, when it says God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. What did he do? He surrendered Jesus. And the Christian life is not just about a uh, a mind knowledge of Christ. It's surrendering to him. So we're going to look today about making choices, changing patterns, and cooperating with others. And the, these three things that will help you to surrender like Jesus. Number one, choices let him reign. Romans 12.1 says this. And by the way, we're going to be in Romans 12. You can turn there if you want. You can look, look there later. Uh, they're in Romans 12 today. We're going to do a a uh, study of Romans a little later on, a, a short study. But here it is, Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. Time out. He doesn't say in view of God's wrath because he's had all this discussion about what God's done for us, which is amazing. So he says, when you see God's mercy, and then he continues, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. What? I'll get back to that. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. True and proper worship. So, so in the Old Testament, a sacrifice, there were two kinds of sacrifices. There was a, a normal sacrifice where basically you took uh, maybe a lamb or, or whatever animal, maybe a dove, and you offered it as a sacrifice. The priest took his portion and cooked the rest and gave it back to you, the part 90%. But there was also something called a burnt offering where you would bring it and there's nothing left. It is burned up. The Bible says that we are to be a living sacrifice to God. Now, how many in here like to cook on the grill? Anybody in here like to cook on the grill? Okay. How many of you are keep the lid open on the grill people? How many of you are shut the top of the grill at all times? Okay. How many of you don't care? Okay. All right. So, so here's what you learn, and as a kid, you know, somebody at some point says to you, do not use a fork on steaks. Now, I don't know if it's an urban legend, but this is why we use tongs, right? Because you flip the steak, you're very careful, all the things you do, all the seasoning, whether it's ribs or whatever. Brian's our professional cooker here. Lydia always tells me, Dad, you're a good cooker. So Brian, uh, you're a good cooker from what I can see. So, so here's the deal with cooking. So you put that steak on. If you tried to eat it before you cook it, oh, that's terrible, right? Everything's hard, you, gristle, you can't chew it. And if you ever got a really undone, underdone, not cooked well steak, you know what I'm talking about. But if the steak could talk, I don't think it's enjoying its time on the grill, right? Ow, that's hot, that hurts, that's miserable. Listen. The Bible says that you and I are to be living sacrifices. Does that sound like the best life now? That sounds tough. Yes, he gives us joy in the journey, but the truth is sometimes when you're the living sacrifice, you want to climb off the grill. Sometimes you want to say, God, I'll do it my way. And Paul reminds us, offer your bodies, give yourself as a living sacrifice sacrifice. So there's times that you actually have to be aware and say, God, I'm going through this trial. Do what you want in me. God, I'm going through this test. Use it the way you want. <laughs> God, I'm going through this test again. 
I don't want another retake. Would you help me to learn what I'm supposed to learn this time? By the way, God never fails you, but he does give retakes. Oh, you didn't get it right that time? No problem. We'll do it again. Coworker, relative, in-law, children, not our children. Now, here's something I do every morning, and I just, I just want to make you aware of it, just to give you some questions. And if you want, you can email me, and I'll send these to you. They're from a prayer journal called the 2959. I adapted them years ago. And here's several questions in the morning that I ask in my prayer time. And here, here's how it goes. Are all sins confessed? Basically, is there any repentance that I need where I need to change my mind and agree with God on any area? The second question is, are all uh, relationships with others made right? Now, let me give you a time out about that. The Bible says, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Can I tell you a secret? Not everybody wants to be at peace. There are people that no matter what you do, how much you go out of your way, they do not like you. And you've got to be at peace with that. There are times that making peace with people, yes, you've got to go out of your way, maybe apologize for something you've done, but there's some people who just don't want peace. But you still, every day should say, is there any problem, is there any unforgiveness in my life? Am I seeking His will in all things? Am I seeking to glorify God above all things? You know, that's a question we need to ask when, when we're going through life. Am I looking for people to pat me on the back, or am I really seeking to say, God, you're first? Am I depending on the Holy Spirit's guidance? Have you been still enough? Have you gotten up on the beach enough to say, where am I, and allow the Holy Spirit to convict you? Are you trusting in God in spite of what seems to be? And finally, will I praise God, listen, no matter what? Now, you've got to really spend time with God to get to the point that you're like, God, I'm going to praise you no matter what. Let me read this next verse to give you an idea of even what sacrifice in the Old Testament. You know, sometimes we think, well, the Old Testament and New Testament are different. Nay, nay. Listen to this, Psalms 51, 15 to 17. Here's what it says. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You don't take pleasure in burnt offerings. You hear how sacrifice, offering, two different things, right? And then he says, my sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit. That literally means a shattered spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. This word contrite is the idea of bowing your knee. It's the idea of humbling yourself. This is why baptism is such a big deal. Because baptism was what Jesus told us to do. Why? To represent dying to ourselves. By the way, we'll have a baptism video in a few weeks, but I think we're going to put the, the beach and the pool baptisms together. But we had three baptisms last week, and one of ours is over 80 years old, and she's here this morning. Phyllis Didiker is here, and we want to just say congratulations on your baptism, Phyllis. And we have wonderful gifts for you. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. So baptism represents this idea of being a living sacrifice. God, I'm dying to you. Lord, this is, it's not physical offerings that matter. It's what's happening in my heart. Have I bowed my knee to you? So here's the first question. Is there any habit in your life that you refuse to surrender to God? You know, we have hurts and habits and hang-ups. Is there any habit? Something that you're saying to God, but I like that one. Right? Number two, so choices let him reign, changing patterns let him reign. Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the pattern. And those of you who sew know what that looks like. You get a pattern and cut it out. If your pattern, if you accidentally cut the pattern when you're cutting from then on, you've messed up every dress you ever make again or whatever you're making, right? So therefore, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. This word transformed in Greek is where we get the idea of metamorphosis. It's a total change. Be transformed. How? By renewing of your mind. Why? Because the battle always starts here. You've noticed that when you want to hit snooze, right? It's typically not a physical battle taking place between you and the snooze button, which is on my phone, which I hit twice today. What's cool is when you have a dog, he gets tired of it, and he will make sure that you get out of bed. 
right? So my dog decided, I'm tired of that alarm. You're getting up. Renewing your mind, and then you'll be able to test and approve, listen, what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Perfect will. So there's three things mainly that affect us in life. And one of them is books we read. This is one of the magazines I get, like 10 bucks a year. It's awesome, right? It's actually a physical paper. It's got paper and pictures. I like pictures. Now, I have not built a single thing in any of these magazines. But here's what I'll tell you. They have tips and tricks in each one. There are several that I've done. One, how to fix the doors in your house when they're sagging. And it's an easy fix. And it talked about how to do it. I think I actually sent that to you, Tracy. And it was a thing on how to do that when you have a problem with your door. And it's a really easy thing to do. I have done that to every door in my house. Why? Because I read this and I saw what was happening. And it made me realize, oh, that's what's going on. And it changed me, you see. God's word is much more powerful than any magazine you can read. The people you hang out with, the magazines you read or books you read, the things that you watch are the three things that are going to influence you the most. And what I want to encourage you to do is go back to that foundation on God's word where you take the mirror of his word and you're able to say, am I really where I'm supposed to be? Am I allowing his word to change my mind? Because the truth is, you're in a world that's angry. You're in a world that's scared. You're in a world that's frustrated. But when you read God's word, there's hope, which we're going to talk about next week. What are the patterns of this world? The patterns of this world, I, I looked up a business article. Here's some things that go on in, in biz, the business world. Gossip. Comparison. Competition. Jealousy. And then I added, because it's Romans, power and control... And lust. Now there's more than that going on, but those are some of the key ways that our minds are affected. We don't even realize that the reason we don't like somebody is because we're actually jealous. We don't even realize sometimes that the reason we don't get along with somebody is because we think we're in competition with them. We don't recognize that we're not in competition with each other. And so I can wake up on a Sunday morning and go, wow, look at that church. It's really big. There's 10,000 people there. Oh, boy, we don't have anybody at our church compared to that. Or I can see a church, they only got 10 people in church. And I can go, ooh, ooh, wow, I'm so awesome compared to that church. And God says, nay, nay, nay. You're called to do what I've called you to do. Renew your mind. Quit comparing and contrasting to everybody else. Now, that doesn't mean somebody can't inspire you. You got a friend that's lost some weight, and you might go, you know. But if you're comparing yourself going, well, I wish I could be like that, you're in trouble. In Ephesians 4, it says this, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. What is this talking about? Listen, when you come to Christ, the old person is made new. God gives you all new. All new thoughts, all new habits. But here's the deal. Those old habits, those old ways of thinking sneak in. And sometimes, if we're honest, we like them. So we go and get them out of the closet and put them back on. I like being angry. It makes me feel powerful. I know that I'm better than that person. And when we feel bad about ourselves, we look for ways to compare ourselves with other people. By the way, we like to compare our strengths to other people's weaknesses and our weaknesses to other people's strengths. If you do the first, then you'll feel prideful. If you do the second, you'll think you're a loser and not want to do anything. And so it continues, listen, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. And we should be, this is what we should do, to be made new. And here it starts with the attitudes of your minds. How do you think about the people around you? Do you feel like you're incompetent? Do you really care about them? Or are you just trying to make it? I mean, you're at the dinner table and you're just like, just leave me alone. Could everybody just quit, quit squirting ketchup on a fire? Right? Oh no, she's got a SpongeBob knife, right? I mean, whatever it is, be new in the attitude of your mind. And listen, put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. I want to encourage you, spend time in God's word. If you've never memorized God's word, begin to memorize God's word. Take one of these verses, maybe. Put it on your fridge. Put it in your car. Don't read it while driving. 
Put it somewhere, maybe in your cubicle, that will remind you of your new self. Here's your second question. Is there any thought I refuse to surrender to God? If you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, then He's going to call you out when you start comparing yourself, thinking you're better than somebody, because you can't love people if you're arrogant towards them. You also can't love people if you think they're better than you. You've got to recognize who you are in Christ, who He's made you to be, and guess what? Just be that person. Put off the old self, those old habits, those old ways. Any of those thoughts, you say, God, I surrender that thought to you. I look in the mirror, oh no, I surrender to you. I love this quote by Chuck Swindoll. Here's what it says. Your call will become clear as your mind is transformed by the reading of Scripture and the internal work of God's Spirit. The Lord never hides His will from us. In time, as you obey the call first to follow, your destiny will unfold before you. The difficulty will lie in keeping other concerns from diverting your attention. See, the enemy doesn't have to destroy you. He's just got to distract you. If he keeps you so busy riding waves, you'll never go back up on the beach. You'll never have time to evaluate your life. Am I even doing what I'm supposed to do today? Some of you are so busy surviving today, you're not even enjoying today. I want to encourage you sometimes, take a time out, take a walk, literal walk on the beach. And thank God for what he's given you. Maybe walk out in your yard. If you live in an apartment, walk out in everyone's yard. And thank God for all that he's put around you. You know, one really cool thing about Florida, I tell people this all the time, is, you know, during the summer it's hot and we like to complain about the heat. But you know what's really neat? If you're in your car and you have the air conditioner on, you don't know if it's 30 degrees or 140 you can still drive and give praise to God for the clouds and the sun and the birds and the butterflies and whatever else there is. It's an amazing thing. Number three, not only do choices let him reign, not only changing patterns let him reign, cooperation lets his love reign. Now let me tell you about something about Jesus reigning just real quick. He reigns whether you let him or not, but he never forces himself on you. That's why in Revelations it says, I stand at the door and knock. Did you know that verse is written to Christians? It's Christians who said to God, I have time for you right now. I stand at the door and knock. You want me to eat with you? Open the door. That's the Christians. Look it up. So, so here's the deal. Cooperation lets love reign. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. But... Rather, think of yourself with sober judgment. Basically, know what you're good at, know what you're not good at. Gotta know who you are. Know, know what the gifts God's given you. And then it continues, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members don't all have the same function, so in Christ we, though we're many, form one body. Each member belongs to all the others. You belong to me. Tell me. Sorry. Each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Now, let me show you something about people. Let's just say life is this wood. And this is what people do in your life. Do you have a sandpaper person in your life? By the way, how many of you know somebody who's difficult to get along with? Come on. If you didn't raise your hand, it's you. All right? Now, here's the truth. Truth be known. Truth be known. If we're honest, you ready? We're all sandpaper sometimes. We need to be honest. We're all sandpaper sometimes. But here's the deal. You ready? Sandpaper makes this project much better. One of the last things I got to do with my dad together, which was awesome, is he helped me build this gigantic oak bookshelf and he showed me how to do it step by step cut the wood sand the wood prime the wood stain the wood put the glossy fun stuff on the wood and I made several bookshelves since then and there was at least once or twice when I sanded I got in a hurry and I would look at the bookshelf later and I could see exactly where I didn't sand. 
There were little places sticking up where I didn't sand. And I went, oh no, I should fix that. But I didn't. The truth is in your life, some of you are avoiding relationships with other people because it's hard. It's work. When you have a relationship with other people, not only are they sanding on you, but guess what? Sometimes <laughs> you're the sandpaper. If you're around anybody long enough, you will realize what they're good at and what they're not good at. You'll see their flaws. And if you can learn to still love people, broken, messed up, fallible people, and you will learn to spend time with them, and ready, ready, and love them, you will grow. The one challenge I have for you today is this. Start spending time with a few people and take time to encourage them. The Bible says encourage one another as long as it's called today. If you want to grow as a Christian, you can't do it alone. I know it seems nice to be a monk in a monastery up on a hill and have everyone leave you alone, but if you really want to grow, you have to get around other people because guess what? Sometimes you think you're really spiritual till you leave your prayer closet and have to get in traffic. And suddenly you go, I thought I was spiritual till that guy pulled out in front of me. I'm not as patient as I thought I was. I'm not as loving as I thought I was. I mean, I thought I was a kind person. I thought I was a leader, but nobody's following. Maxwell used to say, if you think you're a leader and no one's following, you're just taking a walk. So how do you find that out? You use your gifts and you figure out, okay, this is what God has me doing. Some of you are not leaders. That's okay. The Bible called me to be a shepherd, and that means to be a leader, but here's the deal. He's called all of us, this is going to freak you out, to be ministers. What does that mean? You're supposed to minister to other people. You're supposed to go out of the way, your way to use the gifts God's given you. If you want to have that reflective time in your life where God is using you and you're finding joy, begin going out of your way to spend time with a few people, to encourage a few people. See, I've been at large churches. I've been at giant churches that were mellow. One, one church, I'll never forget, people clapped during church, and the pastor got up and gave us a mini sermon on why clapping was bad. I was at another church where they would run around with banners in the middle of church and dance up front, and I promise you, I got hit at least three times with the banners. I don't know what I did wrong, but they just kept pegging me with those things. I've been at churches that are gigantic, thousands and thousands and thousands of people. I've been on staff at churches with thousands of people. I've been on staff where the youth pastor, my ministry was bigger than the rest of the church. And guess what I've learned at all those churches? You ready? I can look back 30 years now. It's not about what happened on the weekend, although that's great, whatever. It's what happened when I got with a few people. And I can look back now and look at the fruit of my life and realize it wasn't about the big meetings I conducted or the hundreds of kids in youth group as I stood up front and had this great opportunity. No, no, no. It was about the few kids that I spent weekly time with that I went out of my way to see how they were doing and encourage and bless them. If you can do one thing, I would say love other people. But to do that, you've got to take time. You've got to, ready, ready? Schedule it. I've got four lunch appointments this week on purpose. Scheduled every one of them. One of them, when I scheduled it, he said, Hey, that's May 4th, Star Wars Day. And I went, what? <laughs> Star Wars Day. I'm like, great. That tells you the kind of people I'm getting with. <laughs> but get with somebody. Proverbs 3, 5 through 8, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, and in all your ways, surrender, submit. I know it's a gray flag, what do you want? <laughs> surrender to him, give up, and he will make your path straight. Don't be wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord, shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishments to you your bones. My prayer for you is that you will humbly use your gifts. That's this next, last question. Am I humbly using my gifts as part of the church?
Do I think I'm better than I am? Do I think I'm nothing? No, no. Look at yourself with sober judgment. Say, God, I want to use what you've given to me to bless others. Is your life full of joy? Are you living with purpose? If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. That's the first step of living a life of joy and a life of purpose is to surrender to him. If you're here today, I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means that Jesus died and rose again. He died for your sins because we're broken, we're messed up. And so if you want to give your life to him today, surrender to him. I'd love to pray with you after the service and you can say, Jesus, I want to give you my life. Maybe you're here today and you're a Christian, but the truth is you've been living on your own. You, if you're honest, you've been living a selfish, self-centered Christian life. Hey, that's what repentance is about. It means, God, I'm sorry, and I want to follow you. Just be obedient to what he tells you to do. Because my guess is at some point during the message, you had a, oh, no, moment. That's the Holy Spirit trying to teach you, hey, here's the next thing you need to do. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, thank you for these moments together. I thank you for your love. I thank you for how much you love us right where we're at. And that even while we were yet sinners, Scripture says you died for us. Lord, thank you for that. Father, I pray too, as we get off track, as we don't take time to evaluate our lives, as sometimes, Lord, in life we just get busy surviving, Lord, forgive us. I pray instead we could use the gifts you've given us, not just for us, but to help others be encouraged on this Christian journey. Thank you for your word that reminds us of what really matters. Lord, we surrender to you today in Jesus' name. Amen.